Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, welcome to the course on medical biomaterials. In this class, we will again talk about uh, biological responses and uh, slowly move towards uh, in vivo and um, animal studies. Yeah, any biomaterial before it goes into clinical trials has to be tested on animals. So, um, we will start talking about animals also soon. Large number of animals uh, are used um, like uh, rabbits, mouse, uh, rats going right up to dog, sheep and so on. So, let us continue some more on the biological response. So, as soon as the biomaterial um, is placed inside the body, uh, I said in the previous class there is going to be a blood uh, material interaction uh, leading to the activation of the coagulation uh, pathway and then the activation of the complement pathway, uh, both of them are part of the immune response system. Uh, then what happens is uh, things start happening, we have uh, the inflammation um, that is part of the tissue response, okay. acute inflammation, the chronic inflammation, then the tissue formation, foreign body interactions and fibrous encapsulation of the material and so on actually. So, uh, um, a lot of tissue response starts happening here. Uh, so, we will look at it uh, slightly in more detail. So, when there is an inflammation uh, there are a lot of wound healing response because uh, when the surgeon uh, tries to open the host body and then place a biomaterial obviously it is all it is like a wound. So, the wound healing processes start taking place because uh, the surgeon has created an injury okay because of the biomaterial impl implantation. So, there is going to be inflammatory cell infiltration. So, a lot of cells like uh, neutrophiles, PMNS, monocytes, lymphocytes start uh, going towards it. Then uh, there is going to be edema, vascular leakage. So, all these start happening actually. Okay. So, the biomaterial uh, is placed inside. So, there is a plasma protein adsorption. Then we have provisional matrix formation, monocyte addition to the biomaterial which uh, here you have the complement and coagulation which we talked in detail. Then we have the macrophage uh, differentiation, and macrophage plays a very important role in uh, forming lot of foreign body giant cells and trying to engulf or uh, encapsulate the biomaterial. Okay. Uh, so, they are all interrelated as you can see here, uh, we have the acute inflammation, chronic inflammation, then the tissues are formed here and uh, your uh, biomaterial gets completely um, fibrous capsule formation. So, both the things happen simultaneously when you have the inflammation healing process. Now, uh, these are some of the inflammatory cells as you can see in this uh, um, picture here and um, these are granulation tissues. As you can see, these tissues are formed around the biomaterial and they try to completely encapsulate your fibers. Okay. And um, as you can see, these are some of those uh, um, monocytes um, which are formed near the site of uh, inflammation or near the site of where the biomaterial is placed. Okay. So, um, these are part of the inflammation and wound healing process. Okay. Um, so, a lot of different types of cells are formed here, and then finally, um, if the biomaterial is uh, inert it can completely get uh, encapsulated. Of course, uh, as I said if the biomaterial is toxic or the um, exudent or toxic then you could have cell death happening there. These are some again uh, pictures of foreign body gene cell formation as you can see here this is a foreign this is called a foreign body gene form. So, different types of cells are formed. I showed this picture long time back lymphocytes, plasma cells, macrophages fibroblasts, neutrophils, eosinophils. So, all these are formed here in this uh, particular uh, step here. Okay. Uh, so, uh, look at this, there is uh, uh, an experiment. So, when we use the mouse raw 264.7 cells, uh, what happens uh, uh, when it is in contact with the biomaterial like polyester, um, then this is a polyester, this is a modified polyester. 
So, what are the inflammatory uh, response when the mouse cells are in contact with this uh, polyester? Um, this figure tells you uh, the expressions of uh, uh, two important uh, um, transcriptions which are involved in inflammation. One is called the TNF alpha, the other one is called IL1 beta. Okay? These two are markers which tells you if there is a inflammation. As you can see in the control, um, they are very, very low. Okay? amount of uh, the level of TNF alpha as well as IL1 beta. But uh, as soon as they come in contact with the biomaterial made up of polyester here, um, so you can see both of them have gone up tremendously uh, by almost 12 fold. Whereas, uh, when they are uh, in the control, that means uh, there is no contact with biomaterial, it is almost like 1 fold. Okay? So, it is shot up. Um, so, what we do? We do uh, some modifications to the polymer polyester. So, you are able to bring it down from almost 12 fold to 4 fold. So, a 3 fold um, big de, de, uh, reduction in the inflammatory response um, which you have achieved uh, by modifying the surface because uh, surface modification helps you um, to reduce the inflammatory response uh, of the biomaterial to this particular cell line. So, these type of experiments have to be done in your lab um, before you take this biomaterial further for uh, animal studies. So, these are called um, in vitro cell line based studies. So, we are using this uh, particular cell line, you can test other muscle cell lines and so on. Okay? Uh, and uh, as you can see, as soon as they come in contact uh, uh, with the, the polyester, there is a big increase in the inflammatory markers. So, most of the um, in vitro studies with cell lines uh, focus towards these two particular inflammatory markers. One is called the TNF alpha, the other one is called the IL1 beta. Okay? So, they look at the transcription levels of these two markers okay? and then you will be able to tell whether the biomaterial is creating an inflammatory response. So, we do some surface modification to this bio biomaterial and as you can see they come down dramatically, but still it is higher than the control, but it has come down dramatically. Okay? And so, how do you do these experiments? There is something called real time PCR, okay? uh, polymerase chain reaction. This is an in instrument which can tell you uh, what happens to various genes. Um, so, we can focus on a particular gene and then tell whether those gene levels are up uh, when, you, when they are in contact with the material and so on. So, it tells you the mechanism. This is called a mechanistic study. So, we are able to tell um, there is a inflammatory response because these particular two genes mainly TNF alpha and IL1 beta have gone up by almost from all one fold to 12, 12 times increase, okay? 12 times increase and this one is 10 times increase. But when you do a surface modification, you are able to bring it down to only 3 times increase in TNF and 2 times increase in IL1 beta. So, do you understand? So, um, this type of experimental studies are very essential to understand the um, inflammatory responses these materials create. And then you can modify the surface of the material so that the inflammatory response is dramatically reduced. So, um, we may be able to reduce it still further um, by another type of modification. Okay? We will not go too much into that as of now on surface modifications, but surface modification of biomaterial is a very important topic. Um, you can do it through different approaches, uh, plasma bombarding, UV radiation, uh, immobilizing uh, um, or coating antibacterial material. Yesterday, I talked about coating heparin. When heparin is coated, uh, it uh, prevents uh, the complement activation or uh, even platelet activation, um, immobilizing enzymes. Um, and so on. There are so many different ways of uh, modifying the surface so that we can reduce uh, the uh, blood coagulation, we can prevent uh, the um, activation of platelets, we can uh, reduce the inflammatory responses and so on actually. Okay? So, this type of in vitro study is very, very important before you actually uh, go into in vivo animal studies.
Okay, so biocompatibility is basically a measure of the magnitude and duration of the adverse alterations. Okay, it is not only how bad the um, response is, but how long it lasts in the in the hemostatic system in the host. Okay, it should not create any adverse biological reactions. At the same time, the medical device should perform as intended. It should not present any significant harm to the patient. Uh, patient. Okay, so these are all necessary um, when you want to say the material is biocompatible. So, so many assays are there for assessing biocompatibility. I've been talking about it uh, in previous classes also. So, sort of we will summarize them. Uh, there are in vitro assays. That means we can do it in lab. There are in vivo assays um, where you do it in animals. So, in vitro assays. Um, I mentioned it long time back cytotoxicity, toxicity to cells, uh, cell adhesion that means are the cells adhering properly and then are they proliferating properly. Is there a problem in adhering? Um, is there a, a reduction in the proliferation that means cells are dying, cells are not growing okay? that is called cytotoxicity. Uh, so, we are looking at cell death, altered membrane permeability. So, as the membrane become very porous. So, some of the enzymes inside which are important come out at the cellular level. So, we can monitor even that also. We can look at whether membrane has become permeable using uh, different types of dyes and looking under a microscope. So, we can have fluorescent dyes and if the membrane is permeable then those dyes may go inside and then we can look at it using a microscope, fluorescence microscope. Okay. We can also look at uh, uh, specific cells. There are so many different types of cells we can look at. We can look at um, um, like I showed you in the previous case mouse cells, we can look at human L6 muscle cells, we can look at uh, uh, bone marrow cells, so on. So, we can look at the cell culture on specific cells. Okay? So, then we can look at whether the cells are adhering properly um, because that is also very important. Adhesion. Uh, is very important so that the cells can start proliferating. Okay. So, the addition depends on the properties of the biomaterial like surface charge, hydrophilicity, hydrophobicity, um, what is the surface roughness and so on. So, we can do that sort of cell addition studies experimentally in the lab okay, in vitro based. For example, I just want to show you an um, example of how to do. Um, what we did was uh, we have a biomaterial made where we use uh, different types of uh, beta glucon. Glucons are produced by bacteria. These are all bacterial glucons. So, they are generally um, some of them are water soluble. In this particular case, this is water soluble. They are very biocompatible. This is carrageenan. So, we prepared four types of gels um, one with the no glucon, only carrageenan, okay? beta glucon it is called. Beta glucons are also supposed to be immunomodulating properties. And uh, this gel is prepared only with 100 percent carrageenan. This gel is prepared with 5 percent beta glucon and 95 percent carrageenan. This gel 25 is prepared with 25 percent weight percent and 75 percent carrageenan. This gel is prepared 50 50. So, four different gels um, with the increasing beta glucon. As I said, beta glucons are produced by bacteria. They are uh, um, biocompatible, they are water soluble, some of them are water soluble. In this particular case, it is water soluble, molecular weight about 1500 Daltons um, and then we grow cells on them. Okay? We grow this particular cell 3 T 3 Swiss my fibroblast. Okay? So, look at this on gel 0 that means there is no beta glucan only carrageenan cells are not adhering properly and the cells have to look spindle say, shaped whereas they all look spherical shaped. Obviously, this particular material surface is not very conducive. So, it is toxic to the cells 3 T 3 cells. Now, look here as we keep adding beta glucon 5 percent, 25 percent, 50 percent you can see uh, cells are becoming spindle shaped. This is the correct morphology of the cells. Okay, they are becoming spindle shaped here, very nice, very nice. So, by adding more beta glucon which is biocompatible, you are allowing the cells to adhere as well as uh, grow in a proper shape which is the spindle shape. Whereas, if you look here, 
when there is no uh, beta glucon they are ph spherical obviously this is not the correct. So, addition of uh, beta glucon is improving the biocompatibility of the material. So, you can do this type of studies in vitro in the lab. Um, so, the amount of added cells also increases as you increase the beta glucon and they also achieve their spindle shaped morphology you can see this right. Okay. So, these are called uh, adherence test which is carried out in vitro we can look at uh, any, any type of cells okay. and, and then uh, we grow the cells and then we can look at them under a microscope. So, it is quite easy actually. Okay. Okay. Uh, you can do another study that is called scratch assay this is again an in vitro, in vitro means you can do it in the lab and the scratch assay tells you whether the cells are uh, migrating that means they grow and start migrating. If the surface is uh, very biocompatible cells will nicely migrate, if the surface is not biocompatible bio it is toxic then the cell migration uh, will be slow or completely retarded. Okay. Say same material we took uh, four different uh, surfaces. Um, this has got uh, uh, 100 percent carrageenan, this gel 5 has got 5 percent beta glucon, 95 percent carrageenan, this gel 25 has 25 percent beta glucon, 75 percent carrageenan, this gel has 50, 50 beta glucon and carrageenan. So, what you do is um, we grow the cells okay, for 24 hours and then we create artificially a scratch scratch means we make a mark with a very fine needle and then we start seeing whether the cells start migrating. So, slowly slowly the scratch uh, should completely disappear. So, this is 0 time, okay, this is 0 time on gel 0, gel 5, gel 25, gel 50. Um, we created a scratch and then after 24 hours we are monitoring the scratch. This is a color image we are put in a dye. So, you can see only carrageenan is there, um, the gap is very large whereas, the gel 50 which is 50, 50 uh, carrageenan beta glucon the gap is very small. That means, cell has proliferated, migrated and started reducing the scratch. Okay. That means, the material is very conducive for the cell growth. It is a very in interesting experiment which you can do in in vitro and this experiment also tells you and um, um, we can use this type of uh, material uh, because they help the cells to proliferate, uh, migrate um, which are very very important um, if you want to have a bio, very highly biocompatible biomaterial. Whereas, this particular uh, gel 0 which is 100 percent carrageenan look at this even after 24 hours the migration is very poor that means, it is slightly toxic. Okay. As you keep increasing the beta glucon we can see uh, the migration, the proliferation is very, very good. Okay. This is shown uh, numerically here. Okay. So, gel 0 um, migration, uh, if you take it as uh, um, 1 and the 25 and 50, the migration goes to almost 2 times. Okay. So, double the um, rate at which cells are migrating. So, these assays, the in vitro assays I talked about in the previous uh, slide uh, the adhesion and the morphology uh, development and the scratch assay all these assays are very useful uh, to determine whether a biomaterial is conducive to the cells. Um, these are experiments done in vitro that means in the lab. So, we can use different types of cells as I said you know here I am showing you 3T3, uh, we can use uh, um, raw cells, mouse and so on actually. Uh, so, I showed you a lot of uh, different uh, in vitro based experiments uh, monitoring the inflammatory markers like TNF alpha or IL 1 beta, uh, looking at cell adhesion proliferation, looking at uh, cell migration using this scratch assay. All these are um, experiments which we carry out in the lab uh, to uh, prove or disprove whether a material is uh, compatible or non cytotoxic. Then we can modify the surface and again see whether the um, cytotoxicity is reduced. Finally, once we are satisfied we can go to animal studies. Okay. Um, so, the in vitro cytotoxicity assays is 
we take the material polymer for example, uh, we see whether the extract from the polymer are going to create toxicity. Okay. This is very useful especially in dental implants. For example, dental PMMA polymethyl methacrylate is used widely. Uh, how do they do? Uh, they take methacrylic acid and it is polymerized using UV. So, most of the methacrylic acid is becoming polymer, uh, most methyl methacrylic acid becomes polymeric methyl methacrylate, but little bit of uh, monomer is left behind, little bit which may slowly leach out uh, over a period of very, very long time. So, is these leachants toxic? So, this type of assay is very useful. Okay. So, what we do is we extract from the polymer and use that extracted solution and see whether the cells grow in that, uh, whether the cells die in that and so on actually. For example, you are using uh, um, amalgam, lot of amalgam based materials are used in dental fillings. So, they can slowly leach out over a period of years. So, are they toxic? So, we this particular assay is very useful. So, you take out the samples, um, extracted liquid uh, from the material and then uh, test whether that liquid is toxic to the cells. Direct contact. So, what do you do? You incubate the material, biomaterial with the cell lines and that is called direct contact. Third approach is called agar diffusion. So, what you do is we have uh, cells nicely grow, growing. So, we add a thin layer of agar solution on top. Agar is used for growth of cells, bacteria and so on. Then once the agar solidifies, your biomaterial is added to this okay? and then you check. So, if the biomaterial is toxic, the cells will not grow. Uh, closer to the biomaterial, but if the biomaterial is not toxic, cells will completely grow even near the biomaterial and start engulfing it practically. Okay. That is called the agar diffusion. So, um, this method is almost like uh, your um, cell uh, attachment and um, proliferation and migration, okay. whereas these two methods are like uh, um, cell proliferation or cell death. So, these are in vitro methods, these are more qualitative because uh, we uh, cannot get a quantitative number, uh, but there are quantitative methods are also there. I talked about it long time back, if you remember, we used to do MTTSA, do you remember in our old class we did, otherwise you can go back and check. Uh, it tells you the cell metabolic activity, so we can calculate in percentage with respect to control, um, how many cells are uh, viable cells are there. Okay. We can say 90 percent viable cells, 80 percent viable cells. Something called MTS assay, it is again looking at a cell proliferation, how percentage of cells alive uh, when it is um, with, with the biomaterial with respect to the control where we do not have a biomaterial. Then we have the LDH assay uh, because there is in this particular enzyme called lactate dehydrogenase which is present inside the active cells or cells which have a good metabolic activity. If the cells die um, because of necrosis, then uh, the membrane um, uh, becomes damaged. So, the membrane perme because of the reduction in membrane perme permeability, this particular enzyme comes out into the solution and we, the measure of the amount of this is a measure of the um, cell that is died because of necrosis or membrane damage. Another is nuclear condensation in apoptotic cells. So, if the cells die naturally which is called apoptotic and we add some dye, we can see the nuclear condensation under a fluorescent microscope and we can tell whether it has died because of apoptotic. If it has died because of unnatural causes like necrosis, there would not be condensation of the nucleus the nucleus will be spread all over the place. Um, so, we can tell um, the necrosis. Okay. These are called quantitative assays. I talked about it uh, some time back and these are the qualitative assay. Okay. So, all these assays are very useful um, in vitro to understand the cytotoxicity. Uh, then hemocompatibility that is the blood related uh, compatibility 
you want to know whether the effect of implant on blood and blood components. Again, I talked about it long time back uh, because the implants can cause disruption of blood cells that is called hemolysis or they can activate the coagulation pathway okay, leading to uh, blood clots. If you remember, we talked about fibrin uh, which and then complement pathway. So, the implants can activate the complement pathway which leads to uh, several uh, proteins getting activated. So, the ISO standards are there which talks about five different test categories thrombosis, coagulation, platelet, hematology, immunology. So, uh, one can do all these tests to understand whether the material is um, biocompatible okay? and there are two levels of tests uh, the basic level and the advanced level. Okay? So, again the hemocompatibility depends on the material characteristics, fluid mechanics of the implant device, coagulability of the blood. Okay? So, if somebody is uh, having cardiovascular problem and um, he or she is given a blood thinning um, like uh, warfarin or uh, even uh, aspirin, so the coagulation does not happen so easily. Okay? Whereas, a normal person uh, the coagulation may happen easily. Okay? So, hemocompatibility also depends on that. Okay? So, I also talked about how to reduce uh, uh, the activation of uh, um, uh, the coagulation as well as the complement pathways. Okay? Uh, and there are uh, coatings, um, coatings which can reduce that, we talked about it uh, some time back and we also said uh, there are certain synthetic polymers which um, are very hemocompatible um, okay, um, and which does not activate uh, these uh, coagulation and uh, complement pathways. So, one can think about using those biomaterials okay, uh, or think about uh, coating the biomaterial uh, okay, which will reduce the activation of these uh, particular two pathways okay, that is called hemocompatibility. So, there is a hemolysis assay okay, for all materials except those that come in contact of only intact skin and mucous membrane. So, this assay tells you how much of the red blood cells are damaged with respect to the control. Okay. So, you also have the coagulation assay. So, it tells you the effect of the material on the coagulation time one is called the prothrombin time assay, other is called the partial thromboplastin time assay. Okay, both these assays are quantitative, uh, so it tells you uh, the effect of uh, uh, the biomaterial on the coagulation with respect to the control, control means without the biomaterial. Okay. Then um, there is again assays for complement activation. So, Again, as I said, uh, the complement activation with respect to the uh, circulatory blood. Okay, this is also an in vitro assay. So it determines the complement activation in human plasma as a result of exposure of the plasma to the material. So this assay is very useful. It tells you whether the complements will get activated. So we have um, the previous uh, coagulation-based assay or hemolysis-based assay. Uh, which tells you whether uh, the blood um, in the plasma um, are getting going to get damaged, whether the, uh, uh, the biomaterial is going to activate your uh, thrombosis and, um, and the coagulation pathway and then comes whether the biomaterial is going to activate uh, your complement system. Okay? So, all these are um, assays which uh, tells you sometimes qualitative, sometimes uh, quantitative um, the effect of the biomaterial on uh, uh, when especially when they are coming in contact. So, these are in vitro assays. So, I can do it uh, with cell lines, I can look at the gene expressions, I can uh, take plasma, blood plasma and then I can do experiments with the blood plasma uh, and so on actually. So, these are all. Now, comes uh, the next step where you are taking the biomaterial uh, to animals that is called in vivo to determine the biocompatibility and safety of the material in the biological environment. So, whatever we do in the lab, 
still it is not really biological. I can use different types of cell lines, I can take uh, the uh, blood uh, pl plasma, okay, red blood cells, but still it is not really in vivo. Uh, but then when we take it to an animal, then it becomes in vivo. Um, so, there are many guidelines for in vivo assessment of tissue compatibility. Uh, FDA has some guidelines, there are regulatory bodies such as ASTM, ISO, USP, they have many guidelines. Okay, uh, which uh, tells you what are the types of tests you need to do uh, when you are working uh, with animals, okay. biological evaluation of medical devices, uh, guidance on selection of tests, animal welfare requirements because when we carry out experiments with animals, uh, we have to follow a lot of uh, um, animal welfare guidelines okay. um, and we have to ab abide by them. There are 19 guidelines for and specific test procedures. Okay. Uh, so, all these guidelines we have to um, undertake where especially when we go uh, into the animal studies. So, okay. so uh, we will look at uh, these more in detail in the next class. Thank you very much for your time.